Good morning and welcome to Clement Parish Church Sunday service for Sunday morning the 13th of June. I'm Martin Russell, one of the elders of the church, and joining me today will be Tom Ogilvie, who'll be doing the reading, Anne Collard taking the prayer for others, Anna Weir who's doing the signing, and I'd also like to thank Martin Grant who does all the recordings for the services, and Lewis Hunter particularly for putting the whole thing together at the end of the day. Let us come to worship our God. Let us pray. We come to worship you today, to praise you, to rest in your presence. Be in our midst, and may your Holy Spirit guide our thoughts and be close to us. Amen. Uh, an opening reading from Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Let's praise God in that well-known hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Lord, how often do we sing your praises, listening to the music, but failing to take in the words? We want to praise you. We want to call on our souls to praise you, for you are worthy of all our praise and honour. You are the Lord of creation, 
the one who made us all and made all things well. We praise your majesty, your might, your power. And yet, you are our loving Father, and we praise you for that as well. Thank you for all you have given us, Lord, the small as well as the great. Thank you for our food, our water, our homes, for our families, our friends, for the people who brought us to know you in whatever way, for those who taught us your ways. Thank you most of all for your Son, who died for us and rose again, and whom we serve. O Lord, who has mercy upon all, take from us our sins and mercifully kindle in us the fire of your Holy Spirit. Take from us our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh, hearts to love and adore you, hearts to delight in you, to follow and to enjoy you. For Christ's sake, amen. Today's reading is from First Samuel, um, chapter 15, verse 34, to chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Our reading today starts from the time when Saul was rejected as king over Israel. Earlier in chapter 15, in verse 26, Samuel says to Saul, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. So, had God made a mistake in appointing Saul as king over Israel in the first place? 
Have you ever made a mistake? No. You sure about that? Have you ever planned to do something meticulously arranged, all for the best, and then it goes horribly wrong, even for reasons completely beyond your control that you couldn't have anticipated, even in your worst nightmares? My wife, Carol, arranged occasional weekends away for us before COVID, often with our friends from Stockport. She had more time on her hands than I had then, but she chided me for not arranging something for the two of us, sometime, any time. So I arranged a special trip to Barcelona, arranged the flights, the hotel, all sorted, but she didn't know where she was going. I should have sensed that this was not going to turn out well when she cut her hand on a tin lid in the bin, pushing the waist down to make room a day or two beforehand. Anyway, on the Friday, we set off for Prestwick, joined the queue for the flight to Bournemouth, and at the last minute, I nudged her into the queue for Barcelona. We got to the hotel, but by this time, she'd developed a cold, a sore throat and a chesty cough. Next day, she was worse. She was miserable. She'd recently started using contact lenses and thought one of them was out of place and tried again and again to find it without success. Until we found an optician who would had a look at her and said it must have dropped out, but she'd scraped her cornea and would need to take drops. It was, of course, lovely weather, but Carol spent most of the weekend in bed with paracetamol, feeling miserable. She did take the bus tour around Barcelona, nose streaming, coughing regularly. And to cap it off, in the morning we went down for breakfast and she fancied the very nice looking grapefruit juice. But when she took a mouthful of it, it was lemon. We're never going back to Barcelona again and I'm never doing it again. So it was with Saul, the first king of Israel. Up till Saul, the Israelites didn't have a king. God was their sufficiency, as Gordon would say. He was their God, they were his people. If they needed someone special, he found leaders or judges when necessary, people like Gideon, Deborah, or Samson. They'd no need for a king, but they saw it differently. They looked at the peoples round about, they had their kings, warriors to lead them in battle, a figurehead to rule the nation. They demanded that God appoint a king for them. At that time, Samuel was old and his sons had been appointed as Israel's leaders, but they were corrupt, took bribes and perverted justice. And so God relented and told Samuel to anoint Saul as ruler over Israel. But he also told Samuel to warn the Israelites what to expect of their king. He would take their young men for the army and to tend his lands, their daughters as servants, the best of their fields and vineyards, impose taxes, take their possessions, etc. Dire warnings indeed. So Samuel had anointed Saul king over Israel. He was taller than the rest a fierce warrior and good looking. And for a time he reigned well with God's blessing. But Saul changed. He became disobedient to God. Had God got it wrong in appointing him? No, there had been a significant change in Saul. Samuel's grieving for Saul in verse 34, 35, was powerful and heartfelt and a great burden on his heart, and he never saw Saul again in his lifetime. When we read at verse 35 and in chapter 16, verse 1, Samuel mourned for Saul. This was not so much a mourning for Saul himself, but a mourning because of Saul's actions. His refusal, according to Samuel, to follow the wishes and commands of God. There's as much anger here as there is sorrow. In his dialogue with God, the prophet wrestled with this.
But God asked him in verse 1, how long will you mourn for Saul? The overarching concern here wasn't for Saul himself, but for the whole people of God. This was no time for grieving. They had to move on. Saul had proven himself to be unworthy. It was time to anoint a new king. Pouring olive oil on the head was symbolic of being chosen by God. So Samuel was sent. The worrying thing about Saul is that on the surface, he hadn't rejected God at all. Worship had never seemed to be a problem for him and he seemed to do the right things, offering sacrifices, fasting, seeking guidance. Unfortunately, ritual worship can be a replacement for an obedient life. Singing songs, praying prayers, feeling emotions, or in Saul's case, offering sacrifices, are all things we can do relatively easily. But obedience, as far as God is concerned, it's much more important than sacrifice. Disobedience is no less than idolatry, elevating the self to deity. No wonder Paul tells us to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, Romans 12.1. True worship encompasses the whole of our life, not just ritual. It's easy to lose our way with the Lord, to let little things creep in that take our time, our efforts to think we know better. Saul stands as a reminder that we must always keep our eyes, minds, hearts fixed on him, because only with God's help and strength will we get it right to keep following his ways, keep our feet on the straight road and enter by the narrow gate. Keep worshiping, keep praying, keep reading God's word, keep close to him day by day. More difficult than usual, perhaps, over the last year and a half, when we can't meet up, we can't worship together, we can't do so many things. But have you used the time wisely? Have you come closer to your God? Is your faith stronger in his saving grace? Have you used the opportunities afforded by lockdown? Verse 2 Samuel asked God, how can I go? You see, when Samuel went from his town of Ramah to go to Bethlehem, he had to pass through, or at least by Gibeah, Saul's headquarters. And if the king heard that Samuel was going to Bethlehem to anoint his successor, he wouldn't be very pleased about it. Murder was nothing new to, Samuel, to Saul. So Samuel was in real danger, and he knew it. But Samuel was obedient to God. He headed for Bethlehem, the town of Boaz and Ruth, Jesse's parents, the future town of Jesus' birth. But there's a wee bit of skull skullduggery involved, of diplomacy. Are they the same? The elders, the wise and venerated men of the city, were not at all sure about this. Do you come in peace, they asked. Clearly, Samuel's strength of character and reputation had preceded him. But Samuel assured him that he was on a peaceful mission. He's there to sacrifice to the Lord. They're all invited, are as Jesse and his sons. So Jesse brings his sons, and they're shown to Samuel one by one. They were probably lined up like we were in the boys' brigade on parade, or the guards. Get in line. Tallest on the right, shortest on the left, in single rank, size. And you looked from to the right to make sure you were smaller than the one there, and you looked to the left to make sure you were, small, you were taller than the one there. So they had them all lined up. Eliab was the first one, Jesse's firstborn. Should he be the chosen one? But verses 6 and 7, Samuel gets guidance from God not to look on his face or his height, for this is not God's way of assessing someone's worth. Look at Saul, he's told. He was an impressive man, but look how he turned out. So he sees Abinadab, Shammah, and all the rest, but none was the chosen one. 
So Samuel asked, are these all the children you have? There was still David, the youngest, tending the sheep, doing his job for the family, able to defend the sheep from lions or bears, small and apparently insignificant, but he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. But the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. There's nothing superficial in the way that the Lord sees us. The Lord sees our hearts, knows our intimate and inmost secrets, assesses accurately our character and faith. So it was with the procession of Jesse's sons until David appears. Samuel anoints David, the youngest and the smallest, the one least expected to find favour with the prophet. The Spirit of God fell upon him from that day forward, verse 13, we're told, and the rest, as they say, is history. Samuel's job is done, and he returns home to die. So God chose David, Israel's greatest king, yet not without his faults either, but prepared to admit his sins and return to his God in shame and repentance, unlike Saul. David was Israel's shepherd king. After him, there were a succession of kings, some good, many less so. The Israelites rebelled against God and went their own way, increasingly becoming more like the other peoples round about them. And God let them be overcome and sent into exile. But the prophets looked forward to one who would be a descendant of David, and Jesus was the ultimate shepherd king. Micah foretold it, chapter 5, verse 2 to 4, quoted in Matthew. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. God does not see the world as people see it. Once again, an unlikely king would come from insignificant Bethlehem. Look at the words of Jesus himself, Matthew 9, 36. When he, had the, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 10, 5, Jesus said to his disciples as he sent them out, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And Jesus described himself fuller in John chapter 10. I'd like to read this to you. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. 
and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So Jesus describes himself as the shepherd king. So, how do we judge people? By their appearance? By what they wear? Their knowledge? By the school they went to? By where they live? By their job? By their car? By their possessions? Remember, God looks on the heart, not on outward appearances. Human measurements of worth and value are not God's. Do we resist his will, or do we give ourselves, our time, our talents, entirely over to his bidding? Have we changed like Saul and become less obedient? What can we do about it? Or do we humbly get on with our job, our calling as his disciples? As each of us is created as a unique child of God, so the call to each of us is unique. It's vital to believe in our worth and value and the uniqueness of our gifts, and to believe that these can be of use to God. Or else, why would they have been given to us in the first place? Our society measures worth differently. The success of money and power, celebrity status, TV programs which champion good looks, and so on. This all can lead to discrimination, exclusion, prejudice, as well as a sense of failure or worthlessness. Our reading tells us three things. We fail, as Saul did, if we follow our sinful ways and don't heed the guidance of God. This failure causes distress to the whole community, not just ourselves. The measurement of worth and value isn't on the world's terms, good looks, intellect, height, social standing, or whatever. Our worth is in what lies in our hearts, which is the way God sees us. Hence the choice of David and not one of his brothers. Being a Christian is not about having to live under Jesus' rule. It is about getting to live under his humble reign about the security and joy of knowing that we have the king we need, chosen by the Lord and given to us. How will we measure up? Are we true disciples? We pray, thy kingdom come on earth. But how far are we prepared to go to make it happen with God's Holy Spirit to guide and strengthen us? Or are we happy where we are? So, Saul or David, Take your pick. How well do you follow your servant king? Amen. Let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Living God, in our desire for meaning and purpose in life, you remind us that you're available to us in our hour of need. As we reach out in our times of searching, you promise us that you will listen and answer beyond our imaginings. When we place our trust in human enterprises, you call us back to your holy place to meet with you and to rest in your presence. Forgive us for putting our trust in the things of the world and let us put our trust in your ways. When the world builds success on power and control, let us believe in your ways of building a kingdom of righteousness and love. When we fall short of all you expect of us, help us to hold on to your promise that you will pick us up again and set our feet on your path once more. So we turn from human enterprise to the kingdom of God, from human failure to the forgiveness of God from human weakness to the strength of God, from human focus to the purpose of God our Lord. We praise your name and rejoice in the love and strength 
the purpose and the success, the triumphs and growth that come, not from our hands, but from yours alone. And when our time of prayer is over, let us lift up our heads and look ahead with courage. When our time of worship is complete, let us rise with confidence to service and commitment. For you are our answer in our time of need. You are our answer in the hour of our calling. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're now going to sing The Lord's My Shepherd in the more modern version. And after that, we'll say the Apostles' Creed together and Anne Collard will lead us in our prayer for others. The Lord's My Shepherd. The Lord's My Shepherd. I believe in God the Father, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. You are our shepherd and we make space in our heads and our hearts to be still before you. In the quiet, we think about our world and we thank you for its richness and diversity. We pray as well for its big problems, war, terror, oppression, poverty, and of course the pandemic. We pray for justice and for peace. 
we pray for the leaders in our world and particularly this weekend we pray for the leaders of the G7 that as they meet they would have a sense of being accountable not just to people but to you we pray for our country and our community and we thank you for all the resources and comforts that we enjoy for the support that we have from the state and from each other we pray for the things that are hard in our country and especially at the moment for the pandemic and its consequences for people who are bereaved for people who still feel ill many months after having COVID for people who are facing financial and job consequences for the pressures on our health care and we pray again for our leaders nationally and locally that you would give them wisdom in the decisions they have to make. We pray for the people close to us, the people that we know well, and we thank you for them. And in the quiet, we think of the things that people are facing and the people who are struggling at the moment, friends and neighbors, family members, people in church. We hold them up to you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Amen. There are very few notices for this week that I know of them. If anyone has need of any pastoral issues, could you contact Leslie in the office and Miriam Murphy, our young children and families worker, uh, will deal with this. If there are any funerals needing, needed, Teddy Taylor of the South Parish Church uh, will officiate. So let's come to our final worship. You are the vine, we are the branches. Slightly different um, imagery, but saying something very similar to the idea of the shepherd king. And following this, we will bless each other with the grace. You are the vine. Mm -hmm. 